So hello everyone, thank you all for coming. So uh, welcome to Functional C++ for Fun and Profit. And I think that there's at least three talks at this conference with the for fun and profit tagline. At least one of them going on um, in another room right now. And in my defense, I did choose this title for a reason. I'll come on to that in a second. But uh, just to introduce myself, first of all, I'm Phil Nash. Uh, some of you may know me as the author of the, the CATCH test framework. Um, as on this, this mug here, you can have a look at afterwards. Um, but more recently, I've also uh, got a job at uh, JetBrains. I'm developer advocate for their C++ tools. That's uh, C Lion, the cross-platform IDE for C++, app code for Mac and iOS development, and ReSharp for C++, like in Visual Studio. So I'm not going to be talking any more about those uh, today. That's not what this is about. But we do have a booth uh, down on the, the exhibition hall, so come see us there if you haven't done, done so already. So we're going to be talking about functional C++, as we said, and about that title, um, the for fun and profit bit. The reason I put that in there is because a lot of material on, on functional programming, even functional programming in C++, which is becoming increasingly popular these days, uh, tends to have a, a much more academic slant to it. Um, you know, interesting stuff that if you, if you like functional programming or are curious about it, it's, that's a... Uh, interesting to read up on, but not necessarily that practical for real-world code. But everything I'm going to be talking about today is based on my real-world experience in, in a real code base um, in my previous job, mostly, which was at a bank on a quant library. So, you know, quite a large-scale legacy C++ code base. So I've been able to put these idioms to, to very good use in, and I'll touch a little bit more on that as we go through. But I just wanted to emphasize that real-world uh, quality to it. So we'll also go off, you know, tack off in a slightly different direction to some other talks that you may have seen or other articles. Um, but I will draw on uh, material from other talks and articles, and uh, right at the end, I'll post some references to, to some of those as well. So let's get started. And I actually want to start just by uh, defining what functional programming actually is, because it may not be exactly what you think it is. So before I do that, just take a moment to think to yourself, what you think functional programming actually means. You know, what's the core concept that it all stems from? You may be thinking of something like first order, uh, sorry, the first class functions or higher order functions. You know, the name functional programming implies that. Or maybe immutability, uh, purity, referential transparency, maybe even monads. All these things are important terms, to be sure, in functional programming. If you could draw up like a tag cloud of functional programming concepts, they'd all be there, right, right close to the center. But not necessarily right at the center. That's what I want to get at. And I want to start there and, and see where we go from it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up the, um, the Haskell wiki, which you know, is a reasonable authority on these matters. And it defines functional programming like this. It says that functional programming I'll highlight it there, actually. Functional programming is a style of programming which models computations as the evaluation of expressions. That's the interesting bit. And a bit further down the same page. It says, in functional programming, programs are executed, again, by evaluating expressions. In contrast with imperative programming, where programs are composed of statements which change global state when executed. Functional programming typically avoids using mutable state. So there's a few interesting things to unpack in just a, a few short, very simple sentences there. We haven't got into in any of the academic stuff. We're just pitting evaluation of expressions against statements. And we know that C++ has statements. And we're going to cover that in just a moment, uh, and why that doesn't necessarily stop us from writing functional code. But what does this really mean? What does it mean to evaluate expressions? Well, notice also that it ties it in with changing global state. Um, functional programming, we often say, is free from side effects when, it, when it's pure. And side effects and, and mutable state tend to go together. We're going to unpack that a bit more as well. But it does also say at the end that functional programming typically avoids using mutable state. It doesn't say that it entirely avoids it. In fact, that would be impossible. Um, either at different levels of abstraction, because it's got to be running on a CPU that's, that's going to be mutating state at some level, but also just in terms of getting anything done. A pure functional program that doesn't mutate any state at 
the level it's operating at uh, would just make your machine run warm. That's the only effect it would really have. So we need mutability in order to get stuff done. Uh, it is useful. Functional programming is more about controlling where that occurs uh, and making sure that's explicit. And that's something we're going to hopefully bring out during the course of this material. So I want to drill into this idea of expressions a bit more. Um, and in a way, reframe the idea of functional programming as expression-oriented programming. I want to tug at this thread and see where it takes us. So let's have a look at some typical C++ code that involves a statement. So here we've got, um, I'm going to point at this screen because I can't point at all three at once. Here we've got a, uh, a variable, a color, it's obviously an enum of some sort. And what we're trying to do here is give it an initial value dependent on some other condition. And we're using a statement to do that here. So we're calling a function, doesn't really matter what it is or what the condition is, just that in order to now give our variable a value, depending on that condition, we're doing it within the statement. And that statement's acting like a, a sort of a firewall for values, if you like. The only way we can really get the value out of the statement is by using uh, an assignment here. So we're mutating a value, and therefore it's a side effect. It's pretty much the only thing we can do within a statement. And that's why, right, right at the beginning, we, we said that statements imply mutability. And they're sort of the antithesis of functional programming. So this is not very functional at all. And as a result, it has a number of problems. Just in such a small, simple piece of code, as well as that assignment, we've got mutability there. Um, and as a result, our variable has to be non-const. We'll come back to that in a second. But also, it has to start off with um, as an uninitialized variable. Because we can't really give it a meaningful value at the start. We could add one. We could give it some sort of sentinel value, perhaps. Uh, or we could give it, say, one of these values and then only set it to the other value given the condition. Um, that would be OK, but it doesn't really express what we want to do, which is to just say the initial value is one of these two values dependent on this condition. That's really what we want to say. It should be simple. The statement is making that hard, in fact, impossible. And going back to the non-const variable, the real problem there is, is actually much trickier to see because we're so used to non-const being the default in C++ and, and most mainstream languages, in fact. But consider what happens in the rest of the code. when we, we don't know how much code is beyond this. But in the rest of that code, in order to reason about what the value of color might be, we have to consider every line of code that it could possibly go through if we really want to, to reason about it. And we don't do that, typically. What we do is we sort of you know, hope, based on convention or ex expectation, that it's not going to change somewhere else. And then we'll end up debugging after the fact if that assumption doesn't hold true. That's a, a typical approach to this, but it doesn't have to be that way. If we can start off with using immutable values, not just cons, but actually immutable, then the whole class of complexity that we've tried to pretend isn't there, but actually is, that just goes away. That's incredibly freeing. And you can see now that this statement is stopping us from being able to do that. So what can we do about it? Just for a moment, let's imagine that C++ was an expression-oriented language, a true functional programming language. Then it would allow us to do something a bit like this. So I've now rewritten it with this theoretical version of C++. So now if is an expression rather than a statement. So now, rather than within the statement having to rely on a side effect, it just evaluates to a value, the value that you actually wanted. So the whole expression, the whole if expression, evaluates to a single value. We can use that value now to initialize our variable as we wanted, give it that value right at the start, so we can make it const as we wanted. And as a bonus, we can now use type inference as well. We, we didn't even ask for that. We got that for free. So that's great. So that's exactly what we would want. And that's exactly what most well, all functional languages I know of give you. And once you start writing code like this, it's really hard to go back. In fact, here's um, an example from one of my favorite functional programming languages, F Sharp. Uh, apart from some, some little syntactic differences, that's basically exactly what we were trying to write in F Sharp. That's exactly how you write it. But we can't do that in C++. Now, I have this superpower, which is I can read minds. And I know exactly what you're thinking. <laughs> you're all thinking, actually, you can do this in C++. You can use the ternary operator. And yes, 
you can do that here. We can use the ternary operator to achieve all of those benefits that we just talked about. So what's the problem? Well, first of all, a lot of people don't like the ternary operator, or maybe you've got a style guide that uh, forbids you from using them, or, or at least advises you not to. And, and there are some downsides to them in terms of things like readability. Uh, it can very easily, if you don't format it correctly or you try to use too much nesting, it becomes very unreadable. Um, you have to be very careful of operator precedents that can tr uh, trip you up quite easily. But if you're careful, if you keep it simple, this sort of code, I think, is absolutely fine and a good use. And I, I tend to use this sort of code all the time where I can. So that's not actually the problem. The problem is that it just doesn't scale. It's fine for this simple case, but well, what if you've got you know, more than one con condition? So you know, here I'm using a switch statement with, with three cases. We don't have some you know, hard-coded uh, way of doing things like the, the ternary operator. So what can we do here? We've got back all of, all of those original problems again. What can we do about it? Well, I said earlier there was no way to get the value out of the statement without a side effect. And actually, I lied. Th there is one way, and it's ironically using another statement, the return statement. See, if we shift that switch statement into a lambda expression, we can now return out of it. Uh, so we will capture the, uh, the variable coming in, do our switch as normal, return out of it. And you can see at the bottom, I'm pointing to the screen again, we're immediately invoking that lambda expression. Um, in some other communities, there's actually a name for this idiom. It's called the uh, immediately invoked lambda expression or immediately invoked function expression. I think that first, first became popular in JavaScript, if I remember rightly. Um, you can do it in C++ as well. Um, and, and that works. Actually, that gives us all of the benefits that we were looking at earlier uh, with the uh, expression-oriented version. So this is a way of faking expression-oriented programming in C++. So again, what's the problem? Well, the first thing you, you might think is it's a bit of a heavyweight solution for a simple problem. You know, bringing lambdas in when we didn't actually need them. Well, this is actually less code than the previous imperative example. Uh, mostly because in this case, because of the switch statement, we get rid of the break uh, keywords. But the point is, it's, it is actually less code. We don't have to worry about it being more typing. And even if you did, that's not necessarily uh, a bad thing. So the next thing you might think of is, well, what about performance? We've now got this function call overhead. We've got uh, you know, things being returned out of functions. You know, surely uh, there's going to be a performance hit. But you'd probably also expect any decent compiler to optimize that away. Uh, and in fact, I did check with uh, Visual C++ and uh, GCC, uh, checked the disassemblies. Um, also checked on, uh, on Godbolt against uh, a number of different uh, versions of GCC and Clang, and all of them gave identical code to the imperative version for this particular example. But since the last time I did this talk, uh, about a month ago now, I, I made that same statement. Uh, someone came to me and they said, oh, but I, I tried this other example and it, it produced more code. So it's not guaranteed, and if that performance really is critical, then, then you may need to still profile or, or be careful. But as a default, using this approach, shouldn't give you any significant um, issues. And in fact, again, this is a, a simple case just involving basically integers. If the, um, the state variable here was actually more complex, this may actually be more performant because you're giving the optimizer more scope to, to optimize things. You can return value optimization, for example, uh, can come into play. So you may actually get a performance improvement because of this. Because the things that make code easier to reason about for humans also make it easier to reason about to the compiler and the optimizer. So the, m the more declarative we make the code, the more scope there is for that sort of optimization. So that's another thing to bear in mind. Functional programming in general is often eschewed because we're, we're worried about performance penalties. But actually, the opposite can be true. Uh, again, always measure, because it's not always true. So that's if statements and switch statements. Um, loops are also statements in C++. So what do we do about those? We've got much the same problems again. Uh, the statement acts as a sort of value firewall. 
Um, we could use the same sort of techniques, but actually, the real problem with loops is we don't really want to be writing low-level loops in the first place. Uh, we have a number of facilities in the standard library for raising the level of abstraction of our loops, which uh, allow us to, to write things in a more uh, functional way. Um, I wouldn't necessarily use for each these days. If you are reaching for that, then maybe just a range-based for loop uh, is what you want. What you really want to be reaching for are the more specific uh, algorithms. I'll put transform and accumulate here. Um, th these are all examples of what we call higher order functions. So it's our first slightly academic word. And it just means any function that takes some sort of callable object, like a function, and or returns a callable object. Uh, but that, that's all it means. So th these all qualify. And in fact, this was, I thought, the complete list from the standard. Again, after my, the last version of this talk, someone pointed out there were some more. That's not important. The important thing is I've highlighted the ones at the top for a reason. Standard transform, copy if, and accumulate loosely map on to the functional concepts of map, filter, and reduce, you may have heard of. Um, technically, accumulate, um, it's debatable whether that's reduce or, more accurately, a left fold. Um, but it's in the ballpark. Uh, th these are the roughly corresponding functions. So they're very important functions in the functional programming world. Unfortunately, the way the standard library is implemented, the STL in particular, um, they don't quite work the way you would want to use in a, in a proper functionally function, functional programming style. Uh, and we'll come back to that a bit later, what we can do about that. But for now, I'm going to leave the subject of loops. I'm going to move on to another section, and I'm going to now sort of build up a bit on this idea of trying to maintain uh, immutable types. Because um, we looked at it for single values. Now I want to look sort of more at aggregate values. And calling this section the builder pattern, you can think of it more like a sort of extended constructor. That's where the word builder is coming from. Um, so sort of some um, similarity with the, the uh, factory method, but it's not exactly the same thing either. So where this all starts is if we want to build immutable types, um, in C++, we can do it, uh, but it's a bit noisy. So we've got to sprinkle everything with const, because const is not the default. Const is not a transitive, so we need to put it on the things we're pointing to as well. And those objects themselves and then need to be immutable, because if they have non-const, well, you know the drill. Um, it, it's a pain, but we can do this. So we go to all the trouble of putting all these consts on. Um, and now we find, well, we can't really write a a default constructor most of the time. So in fact, I've deleted it here, just to be clear that we're not even trying. Because we're going to always have to construct one of these in a fully valid state, because we can't mutate it after the fact, obviously. Um, you notice that there's, there's no other methods on here either. Now, if you think of this as like a typical domain type, so I've chosen employee here to try and represent that idea. Uh, you wouldn't use it for, for all types. Um, but in this case, I think it's, it's a reasonable approach. Th the reason we don't have any additional methods here is a lot of methods that you might add to an object are all to do with encapsulating the changing of state. And if you can't change that state, then you don't need those methods to maintain the invariance. So there's certainly no setters. They wouldn't make sense. There's no getters because, well, this is just a collection of, of values. We can just make them all public. That's not always the right approach, but more often than not, it is. Once, once you sort of free your mind of you know, years of, of OO uh, baggage. So we don't need getters and setters. We don't need any other mutable objects, um, methods, sorry. But there may be some other methods you need. That depends on your types. But very often, you don't need any. So we get these simple domain types that just express the data. We're moving back towards this time where we separate the data from the behavior. It's the opposite direction of OO. So that's where we're starting from. Now, to create one of these, well, I haven't added the constructor, because now we can just use member-wise initialization. Nice new feature we've got in C++ 11 uh, allows us to just initialize e each field as if there was a constructor there for us. So that's great. We can do that. We've constructed it in a fully valid state. Uh, and oftentimes, that's as far as we need to go. But in the real world, it's, it's never quite so simple. You know, a typical large, complex code base. Um, 
particularly thinking of the type of code base I, I was working on at the bank, you get all these dependencies between objects. And I've tried to represent that here but with this person and address object. We've got to get them from somewhere. They've also got to be built as immutable types. We've got to go through this process for all of them. So we can do all that manually, but we start then sort of thinking back about what we're losing. Because if we made employee a mutable type, we could you know, progressively build these objects up as we get these objects in. So maintaining immutability, we end up with code like this, where we've got to build up all of the fields ahead of time so that we can then populate our immutable object. So we're effectively replicating the structure of our object, of our class, outside in local variables. It's like we're doing all that work twice. And we've got to do that every time we construct one of these. So it does start to feel like we're you know, working against the grain a bit. Um, so what can we do about that? Well, just noted that we're effectively replicating that structure again anyway. So let's just formalize that a bit and put that into another class. So I call this one employee builder. That's, that's why I call the whole pattern the, the builder pattern. And you can see we've got basically the same fields again. This time they're mutable, but only at the first level. So the, the person and address, they're still, they're still const, because we've got to get those from somewhere else still. But now we can actually progressively build this object up. I've also put this build method on there. That's not essential to this pattern. Um, I've just found it really useful because it just gives you one place that packages everything up and produces you know, the, the correct type. You could put any validation in there as well, and that saves you having to write constructors on your, um, your built object if you want to keep them pure and clean. Um, again, none of that's really essential. So we'll go back to the code that built it up. And now, well, we still have all this messy stuff, but you can see now we're declaring our employee builder at the top. We're progressively populating that as we get values. You notice we've got dependencies between values here, so we need to find the person before we can find the address. So all that's taken care of. And then finally, at the end, once we're ready, then we say dot .build, and we get our built object. That seems simple. I mean, so simple that you think, well, why, why even bother? But actually, what have we achieved here? We've now got this really clear separation between this sort of mutable phase where we're building something up and the then immutable phase where we're using that value in the rest of our program. So we're actually using the type system to enforce those boundaries, which is a really nice property. So from this point on, anytime you see this employee, you know, you know that's not going to change. But we haven't given up all the conveniences of, of mutability either. And this idea of you know, delineating the sort of mutable and immutable stages is really fundamental to a lot of functional techniques where we want to you know, still get the benefits of mutability. So let's look at what else we can do here. Again, leaning on my experience from my, my previous role, what we found was that sometimes uh, some of these values we don't even have at the time we're trying to build this. We might need to go and fetch them asynchronously. So I've simulated that here by saying that a contacts book, maybe that's a front for a, a database. And we've got to go away and look it up. So I've got this, uh, let's highlight that, this call to await here. Um, hopefully coroutines will make this simpler, but we'll be working with APIs at this for some time, I think. So we pass in the person that we got in the previous step, and then we give it a lambda that's going to get called back when it actually has uh, the value. So first of all, notice that I'm using generalized lambda capture to move our builder type into the lambda. So that, that's another advantage to using a builder type rather than just this mass of local variables, is we can just do that move in one go. So that's, it's a convenience, but it's a nice property. And we've had to make the lambda mutable just because that's the way C++ works. Um, but yeah, it works. It's, it's, uh, it's actually quite a nice way of, of doing this sort of asynchronously building up uh, graphs of object objects. So it's, it's difficult to convey, just on a few slides of some toy code, um, how this really works in a, in a large, um, large scale software code base. Uh, I've, I've used it to, to good effect. Um, but if I haven't convinced you of this, just remember that pattern of separating the, uh, the mutable and immutable phases, which you'll sometimes see referred to as the, the raw and cooked phases of, of values. 
because um, we're going to build on that. And in fact, the next section, we're going to start by taking a little detour, but it's going to come back to this point. We're going to talk about strings. And you may wonder what reference counted strings have to do with functional programming. Bear with me. So we're going to talk about a fast and safe reference counted string. And if you've been around C++ for, for a while, um, you may recall that originally the original design of standard string was such that it could be implemented in a reference counted manner, and most early implementations were. But there was a problem with that, and that's that standard string has a mutable interface. And mutability and reference counting don't mix very well. So we had to go through some contortions to make that work. So we use a technique, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, called copy on write, abbreviated, of course, to, to cow. So hence the visual. So I'm sure you know how that works, but I'm just going to recap briefly to, uh, to set the stage. So we have our actual string here as a buffer in memory, and then our logical strings, I've got three of them here, pointing to the same buffer, sharing that, and then uh, incrementing this reference count. So we've got a reference count of three there. Simple so far. And then we come to make a mutable operation. Let's say the third string needs to mutate its, its copy. So at that point, that mutable operation checks the reference count, sees that it's shared, and says, I need to make a copy. So only copy to that point, hence copy on write. So now we have two buffers, one with a reference count of two, one with a reference count of one. I'm sure that's just all recap for you. But there's a problem with this, and that's that um, well, first of all, we have to protect the reference count, um, either using some sort of mutex or make it atomic. And back in the early days of reference counted standard strings, the atomics we had, if we had them at all, uh, weren't particularly performant. We've, we've come along a bit since then. So between that and the fact that you can accidentally trigger these just by calling a mutable method, even though you didn't actually need to mutate it, meant that we, we really suffered on the performance side because of this. So much so that, well, we found out that cow runs like a dog. That was the first reason that we decided to, to ditch them. But there was actually a, a second, and in many ways more important reason, which is that you can actually get into a situation where you, you have these shared strings, and you, maybe you've got iterators into them. And then because some other string has mutated and taken a copy, you can end up with invalidated iterators. And the first version of the standard actually allowed for this. It was legal. And so we were able to write these reference counting strings. But C++11 changed that, um, ruled that out. So you can no longer implement a reference counted string in, uh, in C++ uh, and be conformant and actually have any benefit at all, which I believe is the main reason that GCC eventually moved away from reference counted strings. I think it's one of the last holdouts. So standard string now is typically implemented using the, the small string optimization, um, which is you know, fine for general purpose. But now, if you do have lots of copies of strings, it's, it's much more wasteful of memory, as well as the, the copying overhead. But if you remember, back to when we first started talking about this, we said the problem was because these strings have immutable interface. So if we started with an immutable string design, then we start with the same situation. We've got our shared buffer, got our reference count, and that's it, we're done. We don't have the mutability causing the problem. So this works, works absolutely fine. Except there is a reason that standard string has a mutable interface, and that's that we do actually sometimes want to mutate strings. So can we have our cake and eat it? You know, can we achieve what we want with mutable strings while also maintaining all the benefits of this design? The answer is yes, we can. There's two ways. The first is that a lot of cases can be handled now by string view, C++ 17, or you can roll your own quite easily. I've had one for about seven or eight years. Um, pretty easy to write. Um, and they just allow you to have non-owning copies of a string that you can also uh, change the um, where in the string you point to and how long it is, so you can have substrings. Um, so as long as there are, there are no non-overlapping ownership issues, uh, that can be a really good solution for a lot of cases. But when you really, really do want, actually want to mutate the string in place, then we can go back to the builder pattern. So we can have a specialized 
um, string type. I call it here string builder. And string builder is now optimized for mutability. It's only meant to be used in that raw builder uh, stage. So yeah, we can mutate it in place. We can make the buffer smaller. We can, we can reallocate to a bigger buffer. It does have a reference count, but it's always one. We never actually touch that in the string builder. And the reason we have the reference count at all is because once we got this string into the shape that we want, then we can just detach the underlying memory, but typically by using a standard move, our value references, into one of our immutable string types. You know, we transfer that ownership in. So now the immutable string owns the memory. The string builder no longer does, so it can't change it. So it's now safe. We can now freely share this around, as before. We can uh, take additional copies. We'll increment the, ref the reference count. So it's only when we take the additional copy that that reference count even gets consulted. So that's quite nice. But then sometimes we may want to take a, a string that we've been using immutably somewhere, and it still make changes to it. And we can even handle that. So if we've got imm an immutable string, if it is shared, and we take a copy into a string builder, then it will have to copy the buffer. So this is basically like that point in copy on write where we, we have to decide, except now we're making it explicit in the code. You're actually passing it from one type to another. You're in control. You know exactly where that's happening. But if it's not shared, then we can move the, the memory from the immutable string into the string builder. That's not technically immutable then, because we are changing the string, but that's you know, according to the well-understood semantics of, um, of move semantics in C++. So if you choose to do that, that that's safe within those constraints. Um, what, what I found was my previous role where we had one of these string, string builder pairs, um, this particular pattern we sort of used once or twice in the whole code base. Almost all of it was building the strings up to begin with and then using them immutably. So that cost that we have to pay there, that we were paying in copy and write, um, we rarely had to pay at all. We've got all the benefits for free and almost none of the downsides. So that's why this is a fast and safe reference counted string, all by concentrating on keeping our values immutable using those builder stage types. And just to be absolutely clear, this is like a view of the, the lifetimes of our, our strings, sort of moving from the, uh, the raw string builder stage into this completely safe, immutable stage that we can, we can share around freely. If we need to, we can go back to a string builder, and then from there we can move back into, into strings again. So we control when we transition between those types. That, that's really the important thing here. So that's strings. And strings, in a way, are just a special case of arrays. So you might ask, well, can we apply the same ideas with array types? The simple answer is yes, we can. And again, in my previous role, we did have array builders and array views and, and that sort of thing, and immutable arrays. But they're not quite as uh, useful in a general purpose sense, because our usage of arrays tends to be a bit different. We tend to have very big arrays uh, quite often. We do tend to mutate them in place a lot more. So we end up paying the cost a lot more. So that they weren't quite so useful. We ended up using vectors uh, a lot more instead. Um, where it gets more interesting is more complex structures, particularly associative data structures, because we can do a lot more there. And what I want to talk about next is something called persistent data structures. So this is another idea we borrowed from the functional programming world. And just to be clear about what a persistent data structure is, when we say persistent, we're not talking about writing to a file or the database, it's not that sort of persistence. It's the sort of persistence where when you have some, some value, some um, data structure of a particular value, and then you, you take uh, a mutation on that, the old value still persists. So what, you, what you're typically doing is getting a new mutated version of it, and you've still got the old one, which you can choose to hang on to if you need it or, or throw it away. But that, that's the underlying principle. So a naive way of implementing these would be to take a complete copy of that data every time, which would work, but it will be very expensive. So the trick to persistent data structures 
is to share as much of the underlying representation as possible. And you can do this to a greater or, um, or less extent, depending on what the data structure is. So to illustrate what I mean, take the simplest case, which is a, a singly linked list. So I'm sure you know how a singly linked list works. But again, I'm just going to very quickly refresh on that. So we have a number of nodes. Um, each contains a value and a pointer to the next or previous, depending which way you look at it, uh, node in the list. And it's important that it's a singly linked list. Because if you have a doubly linked list, this doesn't work. Because what you can do next is, well, if you want to add a, um, a new head to our list, then all we need is the new node with a pointer to the previous head. And the important point here is that the original list, which can still persist, still exists, doesn't know anything about the new list. The new list only knows about the, the original one. That's the, the, the defining characteristic. So typically, we would have some uh, wrapper uh, class, say list, that will have the pointer to the first element. So we'll have a, a new copy of that. Um, we could do the same removing elements, just have now a pointer to an earlier uh, node instead. Um, and we can you know, pile these things up. So we can have multiple uh, instances of our list with different values in memory at the same time, all efficiently sharing all of the common state. All the time you're doing operations at the head, at least, it's, it's a very efficient way to do it. If you need to do operations further down, then it becomes less and less efficient progressively. And, and so you can hold all of these in memory at once at fairly low cost. But if you're not interested in the old values, you can just let them go. And if it's reference counted or using garbage collection, they'll just disappear, and you're left with the final list as if that was what you created in the first place. So that, that's how it works for a linked list. We don't tend to use lists so much in C++, mostly because of the, the, the point of hopping and all the cache misuse. They're not particularly uh, efficient for our purposes these days. Um, they're the bread and butter of the functional programming world for this reason, but we don't tend to use them. But we can apply the same principles to tree-based structures. So take a typical, uh, simple binary tree, um, like this one here. So we've got all these values um, in a uh, strict weak ordering. So each node has two pointers now instead of the one in the list, uh, left and a right. Uh, and in order to find a point in the node, we just go down comparing the values. And if it's less than we go left, it's greater than we go right. Again, I'm sure this is fairly familiar. Um, now, if you got, want to enter a new value into this tree, then we've got to find where to put it. So we'll traverse down the list to find that we can either put it to the right of the three or the left of the five there. Um, and we'll typically add it to uh, an existing leaf. We should always be able to do that. So we can add that to the, to the left of the five. So nice and simple. Um, and if this was a typical mutable tree, then we'd be done. Job done. But if we want to make this persistent and immutable, we can't do that, because now we've got to write our pointer into uh, the, the five node there. And we can't mutate it, so we're going to have to take a copy of it and then write the pointer into the copy instead. So we're effectively invalidating that node. But because we've done that, we've now got to do the same for its parent, the seven, and all the way up to the root. We have validated all those nodes up to the root. So similar to with the list, if we are mutating elements further down the list. But now we don't have to touch any of these other branches in the tree. So we can still do that relatively efficiently. So we can do that. And once we've done that, because we've got a new root, the old value from the old root still persists. We've still got that around. We have a new tree, which is sharing all of the common state. Well, not all of it, because we've had to invalidate some additional nodes now, but most of it. It's the important point. So that's quite nice. But that's a simple binary tree, which has a few limitations. Um, and to illustrate the, the biggest of those limitations, if you try to load one of these things up with sorted data, then you could quickly see that you're going to end up with a, a linked list down one side or the other. It's not going to be very efficient. So we came up many decades ago with ways of automatically rebalancing these trees in an efficient way. Um, and probably the most common one that, that we tend to use today is the red-black tree. Um, I'm not going to go into it in a lot of detail, but just to 
whiz through. They, these are the rules. Uh, the root node is black. The color is, is arbitrary, really. It's just a way of um, characterizing these nodes. All red nodes have black children. New leaves are red. And all paths in the root have the same number of black nodes. Don't need to try and remember that. That's not that important. But I will illustrate what effect that has on our tree. So if we now go back to our example, we're adding our four in, but now this is a red black tree, which might be colored like this to start with. So we put our four in as a red node because that was the first rule. All new nodes are red, attached to the five. But now we invalidate the, uh, the red node invariant uh, that all red nodes should have black children. So what we do, um, when we apply these rules, we always consider uh, the parent node, the grandparent node, and any uncle nodes. So just looking at those, we just have to recolor them. So now the four is a child of a black node. So that works, at least in that group. But now looking further up, we've invalidated the red node invariant further up between the three and the seven. We've got two red nodes again. So we just apply the same rule going up. In this case, it's just recoloring all the way to the root. In some cases, you may have to shuffle the nodes around as well. Um, and actually, when you get to the root, we've got a red root now. Again, uh, the root node should always be black, so we can just recolor that. And now the invariant about uh, having the same number of black nodes on every branch, that holds. Uh, it's that invariant that gives us the, the rough balancing, by the way, because um, it means that the tree can never be more than, than twice as deep on one branch than any other given branch. So that's fine. Let's say that the, the specific rules are not that important. What's important is that now, in order to do that, we've had to touch all of these nodes, if you can see the ones I've highlighted. So not just the ones on the path to the root, but a few sort of collateral nodes as well have also been touched. So you can imagine what that means for persistence. We've now got to copy more nodes. So we can do that. Again, you can make this work. Um, I know because I've done it. But there's this extra overhead. You can mitigate that somewhat, ironically, given what we said about strings, by using copy on write. So if you imagine all of these nodes are reference counted, then as you come down the tree to find the place you want to put it in, you just keep a track of whether a node is shared or not. If a node is shared, then you consider all its children to be shared. But if you're mutating a node that's not shared, then you can afford to do that in place. So when you're first building up these trees, you can actually do most of the operations mutably before anything outside can see it. So there's our raw versus cooked stage again. So that actually mitigates a lot of the overhead. What we found was, um, with our implementation, loading up with loads of uh, financial market data, we had a, a roughly 10% overhead on insert with our red black tree compared to standard set, which we found quite acceptable. It wasn't too bad. So that all works. And in fact, if you look on Wikipedia under red black tree, it does say that red black trees are also particularly valuable in functional programming, where they're one of the most common persistent data structures used to construct associative arrays and sets, which can retain previous versions after mutations. So exactly what we just talked about. And that the benefits of, of having one of these persistent data structures, by the way. Um, th there's actually a few of them. Um, one that we haven't really touched on yet, but is what most people are interested in is with concurrency. Because now when you insert something into one of these sets, you, you get a new root uh, and nothing else changes. So if you've got one place in your code that holds this, this root node, you can do an atomic swap on that. Or usually a compare and swap and maybe a loop around it. Um, which means you can get um, fairly trivial lock-free implementations of these things fairly safely. Uh, it's exactly what we did with, with great performance uh, benefits. But also, another thing we did was we, being financial data, we'd be running scenarios against different versions of our market data with small mutations applied. And with this uh, technique, we're able to hold all of these big data sets in memory at once, knowing that most of the common state was being shared. And that was, that was a really nice property as well. But ultimately, the most important uh, benefit is it's much easier to reason about the code when you know exactly which points do involve mutations. Again, we're strictly controlling where we allow the mutations to occur. So we only use them those places that we benefit from them and not anywhere else. And that's, that's really liberating. <laughs>
So that was red-black trees, and we could stop there. Most people do. But red-black trees aren't necessarily the most efficient data structure, and C++, we're always looking for the most efficient ways to do things, aren't we? So what's, what's the problem with red-black trees? Well, the problem is that the trees get quite deep. And as you traverse down the tree, you're, you're doing lots of point hops again, more cache misses. Um, and in fact, if you loaded up one of these, these trees with, say, 15 million items, you're going to get a tree depth of about 24 nodes deep. That's a lot of pointer hops to look up every, every item in the tree. And the reason that the trees get so deep is because we've only got two pointers in every node, a maximum of two, in fact. So you see there's obviously a limit on, on how wide it can be. So the solution then must be to add more pointers. And in short, yes, it is. But that raises two more questions now. First question is, how do you know which pointer to follow as you're traversing down? With the, the red-black tree, or the simple binary tree, it's just a case of comparing the value, less, less than or greater than, left or right. What do we do here? Well, what we can do is, ah, there we go. We take the hash of the value, and if we look at the first, say, five digits of the hash, we get a number. That number is now an index into an array of pointers. Simple. So this gives us uh, 27 there, gets us to the next level down. The next level down, we then look at the next five bits. Could be six if we want a 64-bit, 64 uh, 64 element array. Um, then we've got another value, another index into this array, gives us the next node. And each node is now either a branch node with one of these arrays in, or it's a leaf node with a value, or a set of values, as it happens. So this is what we call a tree, T-R-I-E, um, more commonly associated with, with strings, like a string dictionary, where each node, um, you use each letter in the string, or each character in the string, rather, to, to say which, which pointer to follow next. Here we're doing it with uh, a hash, parts of a hash. So we call this a hash tree. So that, that's a part of the solution. I said there were two problems. The other problem is, as you can see here, most of the time, most of the elements in this array are null. We only have a few pointers at a time. So although we've got 32 available slots, we're not using them all. So that would obviously seem to be quite wasteful of memory. Um, if you add up all of these nodes, it can actually be very wasteful. So what can we do about that? Well, that sounds like the ideal case for using some sort of sparse array. So what we typically do is we store an integer which is a bitmap for all the set bits being the, uh, the indices that contain the pointer and the unset bits, or the null ones. And then we just store a compact array with only the pointers that are set. And then all we have to do is just, for any given index, we just find the, uh, the associated bit and count all of the set bits from that bit and to the right. And that tells us the index into the compact array. Now doing that, counting the set bits, is itself an interesting problem, which I'm not going to go into here. Uh, in fact, I've done another talk on this at C++ Now just a couple of weeks ago, which has just come up on uh, YouTube. So there'll be a link to that at the end, where I go into my complete implementation of this, go into more information there. Um, but that now gives us a nice, efficient implementation of this. In fact, this data structure is more space efficient than a hash map, and is approaching the same level of performance and what you end up with is something like this. So now you've got a tree with, um, I mean, some of these still only have two pointers, but you can have up to 32 pointers at each tree. You go down, you consult different parts of the, the hash to get down to the root. And this has some interesting properties now. So for a start, the maximum depth of this tree, if you're, if you're using five bits of the, of the hash each time, there is going to be six or seven, depending on whether you include the last two bits from the 32. So that's you know, a lot less than our 24 that we looked at earlier. In fact, that example with 15 million entries will have an average tree depth of five. So that's significantly better than, than the 24 in the red-black tree. Um, because it's hash-based, you're going to get hash collisions. So the, the leaf nodes will actually be an array of nodes, uh, array of values, sorry, uh, which you can either do a linear search on if you're doing a hash, uh, hash map, 
or you can actually do a, a, a um, binary search on there as well to make it even more efficient. As I said, it's more space efficient than hash tables. The complexity technically is O log 32n, which is an unusual one. In practice, I found that for most values, say it's very close to, sometimes even exceeding the performance of a hash table. And really nice point compared to red black trees, you don't need to rebalance. It does assume a good hash distribution to start with, but assuming that, the tree effectively balances itself according to the hash distribution because you're using the hash in order to construct the structure of the tree. So you don't need that rebalancing step. It's much uh, more shallow. So the copying overhead compared to red black tree is also much less, which means it's ideal for making persistent, much simpler uh, and more efficient to make uh, persistent than a red black tree with almost the performance of a hash table. It seems like the ideal data structure for our purposes. Um, and in fact, if you watch my talk, I'll argue exactly that case. So this is really nice. It's called a persistent hash array mapped tree, to give it its full name. Um, watch that talk for more information. I think I've just got time for the final section. Well, I'm going to switch it up a bit now. And we're actually going to talk about another data structure that uh, we've now got in C17. It's probably the simplest container you could possibly think of. So of course I'm talking about optional. Um, sure you're familiar with how optional works. So basically it gives us the ability to say we've got a value or no value at all. Um, without having to resort to pointers or sentinel values. But in practice, the way we use it, it looks like a pointer. So we, we can test it for treeviness. We can dereference it, which will get the value out if it has one, or throw an exception if not. So we get small improvements over pointers there. Um, but it's a shame that they haven't put more um, semantics around this to, to make it safer to use. There, there is one method that, uh, that it does have that's useful. That's the, the value or method. <coughs> this allows us to effectively coalesce values. So if our optional doesn't have a value at all, then use this default instead, which is nice. That's a, quite a common use case. Um, Unfortunately, it's not that general. In particular, I mean, here, with an integer, it's fine, but th there may be some cost associated with constructing or, or calculating the value you want to put here. You don't want to pay that cost if you're never actually going to use the value. So it would be nice if, instead of a value here, you could put a lambda. But it's simple enough to write your own helper function. So here's a helper function. I've just called it value or again. Uh, but it takes the optional as its first argument, and then a lambda as a second argument. And all it does inside is check the optional. If it has it, use that. If not, returns the result according to the lambda. Simple. And now we can write code like this. I, mean, I haven't really taken advantage of it here. It's still returning just a constant integer. But now, now we've got lambdas here. We could actually go off. We could call a database if we wanted to, and it would only do that if we needed to. But we've still written it in a nice um, compact and expressive form. So that's the first little improvement. Let's uh, tug a little bit more on this thread. Because in this case, we're doing something only if the optional doesn't have a value. But we can do it the other way around as well. So I've called this one with another helper function that takes a lambda. And what we say is, if the optional does have a value, then call the lambda passing the dereferenced value along. And this is the start of making usage a little bit more a little bit safer. So now, in our example usage, we're using a dereferenced type, so just an integer here. We haven't had to do the dereferencing ourselves, so there's no way that can blow up on us. That's all been relegated to the helper function. And then a lambda, well, here's the ironic thing. We can only do side effects here now. We've made this into a statement by only uh, doing something with the, um, th the case where the optional has a value. Well, we can fix that. Simply enough, we just return an optional of, um, of the same type in this, is it this example. So now our lambda also returns um, either an optional or, or the value itself. And if we didn't have a value, then we just return an empty optional. Now we've got value semantics. We've made this into um, an expression. So rather than doing something in a lambda, we are constructing a value that we're returning out. So the return value here is also an optional. And of course now, we can 
uh, we can chain that with, with other calls. But there's one little limitation here, and that's that I've made this return an option all of the same type. Um, let's, to keep it simple, it's baby steps, but we can take it a little stage further. A little bit of templatey boilerplate that you can write once and forget about um, to add optionality if the type is not already optional. We can now use decal type to work out what the return value of the lambda is. And then whatever that is, we're going to return an optional of that type. OK? So internally, the rest of it's just the same. Now we can use different types just by returning a different type from a lambda. So in this, e this example at the bottom, we've got an integer coming in. We're converting it to a string, long way around. Um, and we're returning a string. So what we'll actually get is an optional string coming out the other end. Now, because we're always returning an optional, like I say, we can chain these together as well. So in this example, the code at the top's the same. But uh, we're starting right in the middle the middle with, we, we pass our original optional into it. And if that has a value, we execute the inner lambda, in this case, multiplying by 2. Return the result of that. So if we still have a value, then the outer width gets executed, and the last lambda, which adds 1, gets called. Simply enough, this is actually composing bits of functionality. That's a nice property, but it's not particularly readable. And unfortunately, C++ is not very good with functional composition. So a real functional programming language that encourages you to write code like this will have a way of effectively inverting this flow so that rather than writing inside out like we've done, we, we'll push the values in at the top, or we write like a, a series of operations, and the value pops out at the bottom. Now, we can't do that in the general case in C++. But we can do something specific to this case. And all we have to do is change our helper function to be an infix operator. In this case, I've chosen the, the pipe operator because it sort of reminds me of Unix pipes. Now, with that one change, look at how this affects the code. So, same example as before. Now, we can see the optional going in at the top. We can see the first operation that gets performed, the second operation that gets performed, optional drops out at the bottom. And we can construct some quite complex pipelines here in some comparatively simple code. Here's a more complex example. We've got our string conversion in there. Now, this is, this is interesting. The second line, that's doing a filter. Because we're only carrying on if the value that we've unwrapped out of the first optional is greater than 10. So some of those values may, may still end up with an empty optional, and we'll skip the remaining stages. This is starting to, to look really nice. And in fact, there's another property about this, which is that apart from that returning an empty optional for the filter, there's nothing about this code at the bottom that has anything to do with optionals. All we're saying is, we've got some value coming in, and I'm going to do stuff with it. Where it gets that value, whether it's wrapped in an optional, or a pointer, or a vector, or a future, wherever that value is coming from, we can apply these operations to it. Those two things have been abstracted. We'll still have to write different helpers for those different cases, but we can do that. It's a very general pattern that leads to very composable code that allows us to separate concerns out very clearly, especially if we're writing things in a very expression-oriented way. So with all those factors and a few others that I brushed under the carpet, what this gives us is a monad over optional, called the maybe monad, usually. I'm not going to discuss what a monad actually is, but this is a good example of one. And if you want a slightly more general example, you only have to look at Eric Niebler's ranges library. Um, he did a talk, CPPCon in 2015, I think. I think it was. That's it's on YouTube. If you haven't seen it, I definitely recommend you go and watch it. If you have seen it, I recommend you go and watch it again, because it's an amazing, mind-bending talk. And what he ends up with, he works through this demo uh, of building a calendar on standard out. Actually, here's the output. So he starts off with a range of dates, and he ends up with this being printed to standard out. Now, think of the complexity of that layout code there. But this is not the entire code, but this is what pulls all the pieces together. And in fact, all the rest of the code is like similarly very um, expressive. I believe that there was exactly one if statement in the entire code base, no loops, and um, basically no mutability. I think was the, uh, uh, the upshot of that. 
So he's used the same pipe character to, to compose these, um, these pieces of functionality. Not all of these are monadic. Um, some of them are. Most of them are close to. I won't go into the, the subtleties involved there. Uh, but to give you an idea of exactly how composable the, these things are, look at this, this one in the middle, uh, where it says chunk free. Um, if you look at the output again, you can see there's, there's three months across. Well, if you change that to two, then it will just lay out two columns instead. That's completely separate from all of the rest of that, that code. It's completely orthogonal. It's a really nice property. That's why people get so worked up about monads in the functional programming world, because it gives us the ability to, um, to write our code, compose our code, and reuse our code in these sort of ways that are just really nice. And once you understand what's going on, really readable and expressive. So hopefully that's opened your eyes a bit to, to the power there. Now, I think it's a good point to, to recap what Kevin Henney said about monads. Um, I'm not sure when he said this exactly, but uh, I'll, I'll let you read that one. He actually did a, a talk on functional C++ here, I think, a couple of years ago. Anyway, I think we're getting close to the end, so I'm going to wrap up. This is a summary of what we talked about. If you remember, we started off discussing what expression-oriented programming was and why that's significant. How that leads to local reasoning. I, I may not have even mentioned that term, but that's that's what we get when we can reason about variables and values in isolation without having to consider all the other code, and all that complexity involved. Um, we saw how this implies the need for immutability where possible. But while we also need to allow mutability, just control it, we looked at how builder types can help us to, to manage the uh, explosion of complexity in our code as a result of that. Uh, we extended that into persistent data structures, how that can help us with collections. And then finally, we, we just looked at monads with uh, the, the, the maybe monad over optional. Hopefully, that's given you some ideas of some things you can try in your own code bases. As I said, all of this stuff is stuff that I've used to, to good effect. So it's a good place to finish. Thanks all for listening. On my, um, my website, levelofindirection.com, not sure if you can read that, um, slash storage slash fcppref.html. Might want to take a photo. All the references to, to other talks and material you can find there. Um, it's me on Twitter, Phil underscore Nash. Um, that's it. Thanks all for listening.